Allow me to introduce our first speaker, Stephen Lyman, uh, a honestly true Renaissance man, if you, if, if you ask my opinion. Uh, his presentation, absolutely incredible, title being Debutants, Arson, Booze, and Adrenaline, The Improbable Life of a Samurai Scientist. Take it away. Thank you very much. <laughs> if nobody minds, I'm going to do this without a mask. I think it'll be easier to hear me, especially since it's being recorded for YouTube. <laughs> so uh, thank you all very much for coming out. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And this, this talk uh, allows me to combine many of my loves. Um, <clears throat> I, I am a clean, uh, trained uh, clinical epidemiologist. I uh, studied history in university. Obviously, I love Japan, and I also drink. So. Uh, this allows me to combine all of my interests, although not really epidemiology. Uh, I apologize for the shameless plug, but I don't apologize because I always forget to introduce myself after the talk. So I am Stephen Lyman, as was mentioned. Uh, I am the author of The Complete Guide to Japanese Drinks, which you can see right here. It's, uh, well, 1995 US on Amazon. They did have copies still on Amazon Japan. I don't know if there are any left, but they can get more. Uh, I'm also the co-host of the Japan Distilled Podcast. Uh, available wherever you enjoy your podcasts. Uh, and that's all about Japanese alcohol. So I would like to introduce you to Jokichi Takamine. How many of you have heard, b before, before you got the invite for Nerd Night, how many of you had heard of Jokichi Takamine without he having heard of him from me? Okay, one, one person here had heard of Jokichi Takamine. Now, I don't want to, I'm not going to bury the lead, but I also don't want to ruin the punchline. This man, in my opinion, is the most important Japanese person to ever live in the United States. And none of you have heard of him. Why? Let's talk about that. So he was born in 1854. We're in Japan. What else happened in 1854? Commodore Perry sailed the black ships into Edo Bay and opened Japan at gunpoint. Uh, that would have significant uh, influence on Jokichi Takamine's life because he was born uh, the son of a samurai physician, and his mother came from a sake-making family. He was born in what is today Toyama Prefecture. Um, his father, fortunately, because he was a physician as well as a samurai, when the samurai class was abandoned, he was able to make a living for the family. Jokichi was the eldest of 13 children. They had big families back then. Uh, by all accounts, he was a very, very uh, bright young man, uh, very promising, and uh, he was, so I have a very abbreviated slide show here, so I'm going to go back. Uh, so at the age of 10, he was actually, his father studied Rengaku, which was uh, Western learning or Dutch learning. Uh, so Jokichi was sent to uh, Nagasaki, to Dejima, and he actually lived with a, a Portuguese family, English, and to study Rengaku at the age of 10. At the age of 13, he was sent to Os uh, Kyoto and Osaka, first to military training, and then to uh, Osaka High School, which very quickly became university. He was a, a brilliant young man, studied, started studying medicine at the age of 13. Uh, he ended up abandoning medical school because he fell in love with chemistry. And we are at the Engineer Cafe, so I can, here's why I can mention engineering. Uh, he, was a, he was a member of the first graduating class of the Tokyo University School of Engineering. However, his, graduate degree, his, his degree was actually in applied chemistry. Uh, as with most uh, Japanese men who went to uh, college at this time, went to university, he ended up working for the government. This was during the Meiji Restoration. His father had lost his samurai class status, but he could still work as a physician. Other samurais were out of, out of a job. The, obviously, huge upheaval as, as Japan modernized uh, in the 1800s. So uh, he joined the uh, Department of Agriculture, and he was actually sent to the 1884 World's Fair as part of the Japanese delegation for the Department of Agriculture. Uh, and this would have a profound effect on his life. Uh, while here, he was inspired to uh, actually start Asia's first phosphate uh, company. To, uh, he actually ended up importing phosphate to the United States from Japan uh, to make his first fortune. His inspiration for doing that was that he fell in love. Now, he was considered royalty in all of the press that he received in New Orleans at this time, even though his father had lost his status. Um, and he, at a debutante ball, he met and fell in love with this young woman who was 18 years old at the time named Caroline Hitch. 
Uh, he wanted to marry her, but he was not a man of means. So he went back and he started that phosphate company to make a fortune and ended up convincing her to marry this uh, Japanese chemist. Uh, she moved with him to Tokyo. Now, he was a very, um, I don't know how romantic we can say he was. On their honeymoon, they traveled the United States and he studied patent law and, uh, and, and uh, agricultural uh, fertilizer. So that's, that's how he spent his, his honeymoon. I guess it fits right into the group that we have here tonight. Uh, they did move to Tokyo. Uh, by all accounts, Caroline was not happy in Tokyo. Her mother visited, did not stay. Uh, her mother didn't like it very much either. Um, so now they were productive while in Tokyo. Yes. So the mother, the, the mother is in the dark kimono, and Caroline is in the in the light kimono. Um, so now they were productive for in more than one way. He actually was appointed the head of the Japanese patent office. At this time, he was 31 years old, and he was running the Japanese patent office. Remember, he studied patent, patent law on his honeymoon. Um, this would also be a very important turning point in his life. Another way they were productive is they had two children, uh, Jokichi Jr. and Ebenezer, uh, names of the time, I would say. Now, he also, he was, he was a relentless innovator. He was always experimenting. So. Um, his mother-in-law sent a telegram and said, you need to move to Chicago. You need to start a company. So he started the Takamine Ferment Company in Chicago, Illinois in 1890 when the family moved uh, to Chicago. His first product was actually, actually called Takadiastase. This is a, a uh, 19th century Rolades or Tums. This is a digestive aid and it uses koji. How many of you have heard of koji? All right, a few more people than have heard of Dr. Takamine. So koji is Japanese na Japan's national mold. <laughs> All right, we take our mold very seriously in Japan. And koji, when put onto a, an appropriate substrate, will convert starches to sugars, and it will also convert protein proteins to fatty acids, which is vitally important for alcohol production. And we're getting to why that's important here. But the other thing it can do is it can break down things that are making you uncomfortable. And so he created takadiastase, which was a digestive aid that uh, was his first patent in the United States. His second patent was actually to use koji to make alcohol in the United States. He patented that, all right? That's been done in Japan for 1,300 years at the time that he patented it, but because he had studied patent law and because his mother was from a sake brewing family, he understood how to sacrifice grains using koji to make alcohol. And this led him to be introduced to the Illinois Whiskey Trust the Illinois Whiskey Trust was the largest producer of alcohol in America in the late 19th century. They were produce, producing 80% of distilled spirits across 65 distilleries. Um, they, he patented the use of koji to make alcohol. He licensed that to the Illinois Whiskey Trust. They began experiments in 1891 to make whiskey using koji. So a koji whiskey. Now, there was a headline in the Chicago Tribune, September 24, 1891. Whiskey to become cheaper. This maltless whiskey project, process using the Takamine process, they were actually naming it after him, was going to make whiskey cheaper. It was going to actually make whiskey more affordable to produce and for consumers. Two weeks later, there was a mysterious fire at the distillery where they were doing the dis experiments. Um, nobody ever figured out what happened. An accelerant was used. Dr. Takamine escaped to the basement with his life. He ended up surviving the fire. Now, fortunately, the Illinois Whiskey Trust had deep pockets, so they were able to rebuild the distillery. And in 1894, they began production of, so I don't have a picture for it. They began production of Koji whiskey in Peoria, Illinois, December 1st, 1891. What else happened in 18, oh, sorry, 1894? What else happened in 1894. This nobody will know. Have you heard the name Masataka Taketsuru? He built the, he went to Scotland, he learned how to make whiskey, he stole the secrets, he came back to Japan, he built the Yamazaki distillery, he had a falling out with Suntory, he went and he opened Nika. He's, 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 he's legitimately considered the father of Japanese whiskey. He was born the year that Jokichi Takamine started making whiskey in America. 
So the first Japanese person to ever make whiskey, legitimate whiskey, was doing it in Illinois in the 1890s. Now, um, the story doesn't end well, at least this part of his life. In February 1895, so I'm not gonna ask any about American uh, legislative uh, history, but the Sherman Act was passed in 1890. This is the antitrust legislation which was used to break up monopolies. Teddy Roosevelt loved the Sherman Act. He used it, he was a trust buster, right? That was his whole thing. It was used once in the 19th century. In the first decade it existed, it was used once to break up the Illinois Whiskey Trust. So in 1895, February 1895, the Manhattan Distillery was shuttered and sold at auction to another distilling interest, and the new owners reverted to malt whiskey. They stopped making koji whiskey three months after they started production. Dr. Takamine sued to get his patent back, but you can imagine a Japanese immigrant suing in federal court in Chicago, Illinois in the 19th century. It did not end well. He lost his case because that patent was considered an asset for the new owners when they bought the distillery. He ended up having some severe uh, health problems, probably due to stress, and he ended up abandoning his lawsuit and he moved his family to New York City in uh, 1897. Now, again, constantly innovated, he, innovating. He put whiskey behind him. He decided to try his hand at something else. He op opened a laboratory in Harlem in Manhattan. And in 1900, he isolated adrenaline. This was the first isolate of a human hormone in human history. It was done by a Japanese immigrant in Harlem in the year 1900. He licensed this to the Park Davis Company, who he'd also licensed his Takadayastes to, and he made an absolute fortune. The other thing that he had been busy with after the failed whiskey experiments is he started a pharmaceutical company in Japan, which today is the second largest pharmaceutical company in the country, and it, his family are still shareholders. I believe it's called Daiichi Sankyo, is that right? I think so. Um, now, adrenaline has ha saved millions of lives. We have the first isolate of a human hormone in human history and a medical innovation that ended up revolutionizing treatments for various medical problems. He should have won the Nobel Prize. But again, you have a Japanese immigrant living in New York. The beginning of the 20th century, he was completely ignored by his peers. But he didn't take that sitting down. He was not allowed into any of the gentlemen's clubs in New York City. At this time, all of the wealthy businessmen had these private clubs where they smoked cigars and drank scotch and had big fancy meals and they made business deals. And he was not allowed in these places. So he opened his own. He started the first private gentlemen's club in America for Japanese businessmen. It's called the Nippon Club and it still exists today. In 1905, there was a World's Fair. Remember, he met his wife at the 1884 World's Fair in New Orleans. In 1905, there was a World's Fair in St. Louis. The Japanese government for the Japan Pavilion built a replica of one of the emperor's summer palaces, and it was named Shofuden. Uh, after, it was part of the Japan Pavilion. It was an exact replica of a summer palace, traditional Japanese uh, craftsmanship for, for all of the carpentry. They, they built it in Japan, shipped it over, rebuilt it in St. Louis. When the World's Fair ended, the emperor gave it to Jokichi Takamine as a gift. He tore it down again, put it on a train, shipped it to upstate New York, and rebuilt it in the Catskills in what's called the Merrowald Club, which is a private club uh, for wealthy families from New York City uh, that's been around since the 1870s. How could this Japanese guy become a member of the Merrowald Club? His wife's sister was married to the founder. So he was able to rebuild Shofuden in uh, Merrowald Club in Forestburg, New York. Uh, this was built in 1905 in New York. This photo is from this summer. It's still there. I had the opportunity to go visit when I was back. It's not in good condition. It's being renovated, but the Shofuden still exists. And it, this picture does not do it justice. It's actually a huge structure. Um, it was originally on a 100-acre estate. Unfortunately, due to some things we'll talk about in a few minutes, 
his family in the United States uh, had some, fell in some hard times, so they ended up selling off Shofiden and the surrounding land, uh, but Shofiden still exists. And finally, now he, he ended up getting the Order of the Rising Sun award from the Japanese emperor, basically knighthood. He was recognized by Japanese Academy of Sciences. He's, he's well recognized in Japan as a very important uh, figure in, in, in medicine and in science, not so much outside of Japan. Uh, but he never lost his faith in American-Japanese relations, which at this time in the 19, early 20th century, I think was, was uh, quite important. Uh, so much so that he ended up donating the cherry blossom trees to Washington, D.C. And this is why I think every American, and maybe everyone, should understand who he was, because this is a, like, for, for visitors to Washington, D.C., this is a huge part of the experience, is, are those cherry blossom trees that are still there today. He also donated the trees to New York City, around Columbia University, Grant's Tomb, Riverside Park, other places around New York with cherry trees that he had donated. Um, Dr. Takamine ended up passing uh, at the age of 67. He was still quite young, but he had lived with liver and kidney problems for most of his life. Uh, ended up dying in 1967, uh, sorry, 1922 at the age of 67. Uh, he's buried in Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx. He never left New York. Now, Caroline was younger. She was about a decade younger than him. She remarried. She married a rancher in Arizona. But when she died, she was buried with him in, in the mausoleum in Woodlawn Cemetery. But it has Caroline, Takamine, and then the surname of the guy that she married afterward. But at least she, she went back to him. Uh, you remember Jokichi Jr. and Ebenezer? Ebenezer wisely decided to go by Eben. Uh, they ended up taking over the Takamine Ferment Company, which had been moved to, to New Jersey and running the business uh, for a while. Uh, Jokichi Jr., I don't have a, a picture of him as, a, as an adult, but he was a very, very handsome young man. Uh, and he had two problems, women and booze. Uh, at the age of 42, uh, he took a header out of a hotel window in Manhattan uh, and died. Mysterious circumstances, but he did check into that hotel room with a woman who was not his wife. Uh, so that created a scandal for the family. They ended up having to sell most of their assets to recover from that scandal. Uh, Eben ended up running the business in the wake of his brother's death. Now, another thing about this family is there was not birthright citizenship in the United States at that time. Jokichi Jr. and Ebenezer were not American citizens. In fact, when they married American women, they had, they'd virtually never lived in Japan. But when they married American women, those American women had to give up their citizenship. But this is the time before World War II. It's a very, very difficult time for immigrants in the United States. But at the age of 67, the age at which his father died, Eben received his American citizenship. So that did end well. Jokichi Jr. did have a child before he died. He was actually 42 when he died. Uh, his, his son, Jokichi III, uh, ended up going to Williams College and becoming a world-renowned addiction expert, which makes a lot of sense since his father died of alcoholism. Uh, and he was actually uh, at UCLA in Los Angeles for a long time and ended up having an obituary in the LA Times. He also had a child. Uh, her name is Deborah. She married, last name Moyer. Deborah Moyer is still alive. She lives on the Oregon coast. And I was able to visit her this summer and hear much more about this family. And it was a true honor to meet one of his relatives uh, who's still living in the United States. Uh, but that's basically our story of Jokichi Takamine, who I consider the most American, well, sorry, the most important Japanese person to live in the United States uh, in the last couple of centuries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have about 10 minutes of Q&A, so I think we have a lot of questions going on. So. Please, uh, the floor is open. Okay. Is anybody making koji whiskey now? Uh, great question. Uh, so full disclosure, I am uh, an ambassador for Honkaku Spirits. It's an import company in the United States that has actually re revived the Takamine koji whiskey uh, for sale in the U.S. under the Takamine brand. We actually received permission from his 
his estate here in, in Japan to use his name on a commercial product. Uh, so Koji whiskey has been revived, uh, but it's made in Japan, not in the States. Although there are now American craft distillers who are experimenting with Koji to see if they can revive it. This story was essentially lost to history until a, a student at, I believe, Kent State University wrote a doctoral dissertation about him and uncovered this whiskey story. So it's not long that we've known this part of his history. Is it still patented? Oh, no, the patent, the patent is uh, expired. Yeah. Um, what's your best favorite Japanese drink? My favorite? Yeah. Kusu Awamori. <laughs> uh, my favorite Japanese drink is long-aged awamori from Okinawa. Uh, they're aged in ceramic pots. After decades, they start to taste like caramel, but they're distilled spirits with no sugar. They're absolutely gorgeous. Yes? Uh, if, if, you know, if nobody's asking questions. Uh, the original adrenaline that was... Was, was it synthesized? Was it isolated? Uh, he isolated wait, it and they later. Isolated. Okay. Yep. And they, la they later, uh, Park Davis worked out how to make a synthetic. Yeah, because I, I think, I remember like the late 19th century was a huge boon on trying to like isolate or synthesize this like mysterious hormone on mm -hmm. this. So it's the first time I've heard of his name at least on this. It's incredible. Yeah. There was some controversy about who did this and also. Yeah, you know, all of these great men of, of science, I think they didn't do it by themselves. They're not sitting in a laboratory on their own doing these experiments. He had a team, and apparently it was one of the junior scientists on his team that actually was successful in doing this, but he did it in Dr. Takamine's laboratory, being paid by Dr. Takamine to do the work, so the, the, the big guy gets the credit. What, was it like another American, or was it another Japanese chemist or his I lab? Don't, or? don't recall. Unfortunately. I, I'm interested, like the composition yeah. of like races in his lab in that sense. Like, yeah, I did. I, I, re, I was able to acquire a copy of his original English language biography, which was published in 1928. It's out of print, obviously, uh, but I have a copy of it. I just haven't read it since I've been back. But okay. yes, his well, the Taki Diastase did very, very well. The adrenaline did very, very well. Uh, his whiskey actually never went to market. The, the whiskey was was being barrel whiskey has to be barrel aged before it's sold. So in three months, they had made some, put it in barrels, but the new owners might not even know, understood what was in those barrels and probably just blended it into other products. But there was never like a Koji whiskey released into American uh, liquor stores. I, yes. like, I'm sorry if I had got several app questions to ask. The first one was like, was his Koji whiskey legal in the United States? Because like from the, those kind of uh, bourbon laws, you got to be in new barrels, 51% of corn, whatever, whatever. So was using Koji that makes it legal, a legal whiskey? All, all of the, the rules around bourbon production uh, were actually passed by Congress in like the 1960s. Oh. So this predated all of that. Uh, oh. and, and actually, you can still make whiskey in America in any way you want to, as long as it's made from grain and distilled and aged in oak for at least three years. Those are the rules for American whiskey. So this still qualifies as whiskey in the United States. You just can't call it bourbon, oh, unless well. it's made with corn. Now, he was actually making his whiskey with corn. The Revival brand does not use corn because, personally, I, and I think malt whiskey fans would agree, corn is an inferior grain for whiskey production. <laughs> It can, yeah. There are there are actually corn shochu. So ko shochu is a, the, lo the traditional distilled spirit here in Japan that uses koji for the fermentation process. And there are corn shochu. That's certainly possible. He was actually growing his koji on a blend of cerealized oats and wheat, and then using that inoculate in the fermentation with corn. Now that would not taste good, to tell you the truth. Remember, he was trying to make whiskey cheaper. He was not trying to make whiskey better. Right? That's the unromantic part of his story. Well, like another question, perhaps the second part of the question that I ask is that what do you think, like personally, what do you think, like those kind of the efforts trying to make intoxicating beverages cheaper? It's it's like it's a way to intoxicate more people or let more people enjoy the thing. But then again, like if it goes cheaper, is this a natural tendency? It's like it's gonna taste worse. What do you think of this? So I studied U.S. entrepreneurial history in college. So my su supposition is that, that, that the savings, the cost savings, were going to only go to the Illinois Whiskey Trust. It wasn't actually going to become cheaper the, for the consumer. They were just going to be able to make it cheaper and sell it for the same price. So they were going to increase their margins. Um, but that's the incentive. The incentive is always to make things cheaper. I mean, 
we're in Japan. I, I, have, I, I don't know how many of you realize this, but Japanese are extremely, extremely price sensitive for alcohol. There's a, re there's a reason why haposhu is more popular than malt beer, because it's cheaper. There's a reason why chuhais, canned chuhais are cheaper, are, are more popular than craft beer. It's cheaper, right? And we, let's not even get into the absurd pricing for shochu in this country, because it's incredible and it's so affordable. You should definitely be spending more for your shochu. You did, didn't I? <laughs> you did. <laughs> you can't escape from that. It's pretty early on in the talk. Yeah, right. it's been a long day. <laughs> <laughs> um, you'll have to get back to me. <laughs> no worries. For maybe one or two more questions? Okay, we'll do. In, in the United States, do you have to remember his name to get high scores in exams in schools? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, he's, he's virtually unknown in the US. It's really incredible. When I tell this story to people, they just, they've never heard of him. They're just really surprised. So I think you learn about him in school here in Japan, right? Cherry blossom trees and adrenaline, most likely, but uh, not the whiskey story, not other parts of his life. So. So after the other company took over uh, the distillery in Chicago, why do you think they stopped trying to make the Koji whiskey if it was going to be cheaper? Yeah, great, great question. I, I glossed over that, and that's part of the problem with improvising with a few slides. Um, the maltsters were pretty powerful, and it was all run by the mob. So yeah, it's Chicago, right? <laughs> So it was actually Peoria, Illinois, but the, the mob ran the state. So it was, it was definitely a uh, financial decision and not wanting to have kneecaps broken decision. So. Maybe Sorry. one more yep. quick question. Okay, yeah. The nuance is that it was sabotage on the facility. Right? There was an accelerant used. It was arson. It's, okay, yeah. Yeah. And, and they, but they is there any evidence to say who performed that sabotage? Or? Illinois 19th century mob. But it's just, there's no evidence because they, nobody would talk. Right? <laughs> Anyone who was willing to talk was no longer with us. So you're saying it was the Irish then? <laughs> well, the maltsters would have been probably from either England, Ireland, Scotland. I think the Germans, because of malt, malt beer, they're German, there are a lot of German distillers, actually. Yeah. So I, that's probably who made up the Maltsters Union. I don't know uh, who, who was breaking kneecaps at the time. <laughs> All right. Well, everybody, please give another round of applause to Stephen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. 